Hi everyone, my name is Viv and I'm the Marketing and Events Coordinator for Remarkable. Today we're going to be having a conversation with three amazing people who joined us as problem statement champions for our recent Designathon. This event was online and it welcomed over 120 participants from 10 different countries, all of whom were invited to tackle one of three problem statements. Um, and it was really an invitation to experience how good design can change the lives of people with disability and beyond that. Uh, so we were joined by Sukriti, who joined us all the way from New York, uh, currently working for Spotify and was the problem statement champion for our first problem, which was remote service and support. And then we had Sophie who joined us from the Cerebral Palsy Alliance uh, and she was the leader for the second problem statement which was tech for those in care. And finally we had Humphrey who joined us all the way from New Zealand um, from No Hands No Excuses who was the problem statement champion for our final challenge which was inclusive esports. And we might pass the mic to you Sukriti if you could just um, introduce yourself and let us know a bit about your background in this space and and why it is that you're, you were passionate about this problem statement. I started in accessibility about five years ago uh, when I was working as an Android developer. And I started working on the solution to make charts and graphs accessible for people who are visually impaired. Uh, as, a, as a primary visual means of communicating information, it's very hard for someone who can't see or can partially see to derive uh, meaningful insights from the huge amount of data that's available on a chart. Uh, and that was my first uh, project in accessibility is to use music and haptics to do that. Since then, um, I've done a bunch of other work um, around instrumentation, around measuring impact for the work that we do in accessibility, especially at bigger companies. Uh, right now, I work at Spotify as a product manager on mobile apps and accessibility, and, and that's been very rewarding. Remote service and support was one of the broader uh, problem statement areas that, that George first shared with me. Uh, and the reason I felt passionate about that one was that it's so widely applicable, and especially now that m most of our lives are moved online, mm -hmm. and to make sure that service, which can be described by uh, an app or a, or a website or an actual physical service that you would have had otherwise, that's much harder to access now because of COVID. How much harder does that become for someone with uh, a disability um, on top of what's going on in the world? So I felt like it's, a, it's an even more important um, problem to tackle at this point. Thank you so much for sharing, Sukriti. It sounds like you're part of some incredible things over there uh, in Spotify and from everyone at Remarkable and for all our participants, um, thank you so much for waking up at some very early times in the morning to participate. Just further shows your passion for this space. Um, so thank you so much. And Sophie, we might pass the mic to you. If, if you could do a similar thing where you just introduce your problem statement um, and perhaps a bit about your career, which led you to being a problem statement champion. Hey, um, my name's Sophie Marmont. Um, I have been involved with a few of the design and done processes in the past and really have loved them. And I think it launched an idea in my own head that this space it's really important and I just loved the whole feeling going back quite a few years ago to my first one that people took a moment to understand what it might be like to um at tech or product that isn't accessible and how that whole process was exciting for me to for people to embrace what it might mean to have accessible products around them. The challenge was in empowering those receiving care um, to live their best lives with every support lined with their goals and aspiration. So that was a big statement and I think um it, it could it did go in many directions. Um it was very broad but I think that was a good thing that it was so broad so people could actually think about what that 
statement to my main. Thank you so much, So uh, It's great to have someone from our CPA family join us for this for this challenge and Sophie, your, the wisdom and the, the expertise that you bring is just exceptional. So thank you so much. And we'll come back to you a little bit later. But before then, we'll introduce Humphrey. Um, Humphrey, we'll pass the mic to you. If you could introduce yourself and your problem statement, that would be great. My name is Humphrey. You may know me as No Hands in Zid. Uh, and I do No Hands, No Excuses content creating on a lot of platforms, including Twitch, YouTube, uh, and talking a lot on Twitter about accessibility and gaming, mainly. Hence why I have been had the opportunity to be here and do uh, this amazing designer song with the team at Remarkable because of my involvement with esports and accessibility uh, in video games. As someone with no fingers, I take great pride in doing my best to play all the difficult games that people with 12 fingers struggle to hit all the buttons to. Uh, and I did an awesome panel, actually, with the team at Remarkable and uh, a buddy of mine, Stephen Spawn, and some others on esports accessibility and why it matters. And from there, I got to know the awesome team. And uh, yeah, they asked me to come back and help lead the problem statement of how can we make esports more inclusive and more accessible for people with disabilities. And while we're on the topic, um, I would love to ask you, in your experience in the gaming industry, do you believe that recently the conversation around inclusion and accessibility has really started to gain momentum and is changing the face of the industry? Or do you think that uh, it's still not seen as a priority um, when designing in this industry? The answer to your question is yes. Uh, <laughs> everything, everything you just said. It it's got momentum. Uh, people really care about accessibility in a lot of our industry. Um, it's especially prevalent when you look at companies like Microsoft, uh, who in their latest, you know, Xbox Series X console release put accessibility front and center of, I mean, I did a video on it myself, but on the, the moment you get a brand new Xbox, it arrives in a box that someone with a disability can open. And so if companies like Microsoft are out there doing it, they're, uh, they're leading the charge and it means other companies are picking up along the way. Uh, especially in gaming, there are awesome companies like Logitech have recently got on board. Logitech are big on uh, gaming, gaming peripherals uh, and computers in general. Um, and they have put out a awesome little line of buttons and switches that works with Xbox's accessibility controller. Uh, and again, that's just another way that this, this train is coming of accessibility for everybody. And I think uh, in games as well, not necessarily in competitive esports titles so much, but at least in and a lot of the story games that are out there, they are doing great things to wave the banner in a public spotlight about why accessibility matters. Thank you so much, Humphrey. It is great to hear that things are moving in a positive direction towards a more inclusive and accessible industry, but also a really good reminder that there is still some work to do. Um, and so glad that things like Designathon can help in that journey. Uh, and and Sukriti, I'd love to jump over to you. A, a pretty core component of what we do at Remarkable is that we ensure that everybody is working in collaboration with the people with lived experience um, of these barriers that we're trying to remove. And I would love to know, in your experience um, in the tech industry, do you think that, that, that they are moving towards um, prioritising inclusion and accessibility? And, and is this critical component of, of collaboration with people with lived experience of disability um, being seen uh, in the important light that it should be? I think there's a long way for for us as an industry to, to go in that direction, but it's definitely getting better uh, every year, uh, every quarter, as people are learning more about what accessible design is. One of the barriers I think that'll really solve the problem is once people start learning about this um, at school, whether it's high school or college, when they're learning computer science to think about 
how do you design for someone who can't see and how do you design for someone who has a hearing impairment or a motor impairment and, and embed that in education before it comes into practice because to unlearn the things you have learned for years is much harder than just starting off on the right foot. I love what you've said there, Sukriti, about this idea of um, needing to educate people rather than expecting them to unlearn in the future. Um, I think that's a really that's a it's a really great way of phrasing that. Um, and Sophie, I'm curious to know, in your experience working with CPA and even in your own personal experience, do you still or have you noticed an improvement in the technology available to those in care? Uh, and to add to that, do you still think there are quite big gaps in the, the products that are available and there's still some areas that people can be um, and or problems that people can be working to solve? Absolutely. Um, I mean, for, for me, for example, um, the technology that I've used is my, um, life-changing and just I look at a product and think oh I can do this this and this but this could be improved upon or this is a area that um, I, I take longer to do something so it's um but definitely I've seen a big change in that space. Thank you, everyone, for answering some questions about your careers to date. You're all incredible people, and I encourage everyone watching to reach out to you all. Um, now, we understand that something like a design-a-thon, uh, originally ours used to just be a, a one-day thing, but this being an online um, event, we, d we did it over roughly three to four weeks, and we hosted two-hour workshops every week. And then we hosted a pitch night at the end. So it was quite fast paced and, and, and it had quite a lot of momentum. But you can imagine that being a part of something like this, as soon as it's over, that energy that you get from the program, it, it kind of drops off. And I would love to know if there's a bit of advice um, or words of encouragement that you would give to our participants to motivate them to keep pursuing their solutions to the problem statements. Uh, what would it be or what would you say? I think... Uh, the most important piece of advice I would give them, given that I've engaged with so many of them and I know that they already come with so much compassion and consideration for people with different backgrounds and abilities, that I don't need to tell them anything about that. And I feel so excited that that's already the case. What I would say is for the teams that didn't win or don't go into the accelerator, to still consider the problems that they came up with because they're valuable problems to solve and obsess over the problem more than the solution. And as they go and build and learn more, it's possible they'll come up with something really great. And if they don't, it's still a valid problem that deserves solving. I think um, to, to pursue their ideas and to think beyond the, the group that they're actually um, designing for and, and thinking of the universal application to that idea and the potential and um, to give them that encouragement and that so many ideas had started in this space but have, have reached to so many other groups to say, well, that's, that will make my life easier. And I think that's the real beauty of this process, not just thinking about one group and solving that problem, which is really important, but then having that universal idea. I would say, actually, there were no bad ideas in, in the ones that came through as presentations. Everything had some sort of merit. And I think that being said, it means there's you know, a worthy reason if they can to keep doing it. Uh, I think if they're looking for motivation as to why they should keep doing it, they should probably go back and listen and, and read through their interviews again. Because those are the people whose lives are going to be changed by the product that they've come up with, whether they were the winning product or not. Those interviews are what drove them to make the product they chose to make 
and in those interviews is is a lot of reasons why they should keep doing it. Well, Sophie, Sukriti and Humphrey, thank you all so much for participating in this conversation. It was great to see you all again after Designathon. Um, you were incredible and our participants and our remarkable team are lucky to have you. Uh, I encourage everyone to, to jump online and follow your journeys. Uh, I'm sure you're going to make huge waves in the space that you're working in. Um, for everyone watching, if you are inspired or motivated, please apply for our next Designathon. Uh, nothing set in stone yet in terms of dates, but I'm sure that we'll have one. Um, and before then, our uh, expressions of interest are open now for our SID21 program. Uh, this is an accelerator program for early stage startups um, working in the disability tech space, uh, aiming to remove barriers to people with disabilities. So if this sounds like you, then jump onto our website and submit an expression of interest. You never know what will happen. Mm -hmm.